Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I hope to have a, a very interesting conversation uh, about um, atheism uh, and uh, Darwinism, uh, Dar Darwinistic style of uh, evolution that uh, man has evolved from a simple single-celled organism into what we are today. Um, and I have an expert on the subject with me today, Dr. Jack. And uh, he certainly has all the credentials. Uh, so I have a lot of questions uh, for you. But first, just introduce yourself and just tell us about your scientific expertise so that we, we, uh, we can see if you have uh, the credentials to uh, answer these questions. Okay, well, I, I, I'm counting on uh, all your knowledge and expertise to help me with some questions I have. Uh, I, I think I have a lot of questions for you, but I, I approach this conversation, and as a matter of fact, I approach all my studies in life uh, with um, rooted in this, in this uh, premise. Uh, it's not my original saying, but I, I think it's a, a good way to... Um, Think about life and all all life's questions, and that is that uh, the the uh, skepticism is the antiseptic for the mind. Uh, re remember why we debate. Uh, the only thing we have to lose are the errors that we hold. Now, who but a stubborn fool would hold on to their errors once they've been exposed? I think that's a good philosophy for everyone to adopt, and I. Uh, so I I approach everything with skepticism. Um, now, but when when I'm satisfied that uh, maybe the position that I hold is proven to be wrong, I certainly don't want to be a stubborn fool and hold on to a, a, an error. So. Uh, if, if, if you can show me that my uh, current uh, belief system is, is all wrong, then I don't want to continue believing. I'll, I'll certainly change. I've, I've changed my opinion on numerous uh, uh, very uh, big questions in life because of conversations like this. And, and people explained to me another point of view, and I, I listened, and they actually persuaded me. So I'm, I'm, I'm entering this conversation with an open mind. And I hope that uh, I hope that you you can adopt that attitude if you if you don't already have that attitude. And I hope the viewing audience, anybody who watches this, they can adopt that attitude about everything in life. Let's be skeptical. Let's just not accept everything just with, blindly without any uh, you know thought behind it. And just just because maybe an expert tells us something, let's let's challenge all the experts. Let's bring skepticism into everything. So that's how I'm going to uh, approach this conversation. And uh, first, just give me your thoughts on just what I just said. I agree. That's why we have books, and that's why, why we have the scientific method, so that we can look at things, observe things, come up with hypotheses, and then test them, and then retest them to see if the data that we collect is accurate and reproducible. And that's what science does. I love science. So I'm all for being open-minded about this. Okay, okay, well, that, that gets, gets me to a very good uh, question right off the bat here, and that is, you know, uh, w what is science? I, I mean, I, to me, the word science literally means uh, knowledge. Um, uh, conscience, the word conscience, mean, the prefix to that word is con. Uh, it, it means with. So conscience means w with knowledge. A person has knowledge. With conscience, it's, you have the knowledge of right and wrong innately in you. Uh, so the word science means knowledge, and you mentioned scientific method. 
So uh, let me ask you to define what, what is the scientific method you referenced. Well, just what I previously mentioned, you know, that, that um, we observe things in our natural world and come to conclusions based on our observations and, and coming up with hypothesis, how things work. And, and then we do experiments and, and record data and look at that, analyze that, and look at each other's uh, work within the scientific community and see if those um, observations are reproducible. And if they are, then, you know, us scientists, us smart scientists, we're onto something, and you know, enough of us agree with it, then you know, we can pretty much count on what our observations are true. So mm-hmm. that's what the scientific method is. You know, the the ancient people that wrote the Bible and everything, they didn't have any scientific method like we have since the age of enlightenment. Okay. Um, all right. Let's so let's begin at at the beginning, uh, and that would be. Um, the, the, the universe, or what we know of as the universe, uh, I, 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 as I understand it, uh, there was a time when people believed the universe was eternal. It always existed. But now I think even scientists all agree that the universe came into existence. It, it had a beginning point. Um, so uh, my question is, tell me how that came about. How did how did matter and energy and everything in the universe come into existence? Well, we have an idea. We can, you know, trace back billions of years, you know, where this cosmic evolution began, and you know, we basically have come to a consensus that a big explosion, we sort of call it the Big Bang, and we capitalize the B on the big and the B on the bang to make it official. (laughs) Um, That's how the universe was created. And, you know, something, if you're reading uh, anything there, you know, if you're reading your Bible that has a period at the end, just imagine something smaller than that period exploding into everything we see today billions of years ago. And that's what us smart scientists have figured out thus far. Okay. All right. So uh, you did use a word that I, I was actually surprised to hear come from you. And you said that that's how the universe was created. Um, maybe you misspoke. I, I, I know you, you don't believe that there is an actual creator. So did you mean that that's how the, the, the universe like created itself or came into existence? Yeah, it just came into existence. You know, just a random chance of that that happened. And you know, I mean, this this may not even be the only game in town. We may, you know, with string theory and all these more theoretical physicists, there may be multiverses, and we're just part of a little bubble. Um, you know, so yeah, it, it could just have happened spontaneously. Or okay. Later. All right, then you, you you may get tired of me saying this. I, I imagine I'll probably repeat this many times in our conversation, and that is that I'm I'm approaching everything you say as a skeptic, uh, but I'm I'm an open-minded skeptic. So my question is, um, this this premise you just laid out for me that there was something that existed that size smaller than the head of a pen or a, a period on paper. Uh, and then it exploded and, and became the universe. Let me ask you, how do you know that? I mean, what, why should I believe that? What, what do you, can you have to convince me that, that that's a reality and that this can be proven? Well, we know that stars are nuclear fusion entities in the sky. And they sort of, you know, it's like alchemy. You know, you can sort of look at it like that, that the stars sort of formed and over billions of years, we know that, you know, different elements have formed and from that, we have the planets and everything that we see today. You know, even even the iron in our blood came from a star that exploded billions of years ago. You know, my favorite astrophysicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, he, he says, you know, we look up at the universe and we see that we're part of the universe and in the universe, but really the universe is in us because the stars that exploded made us. And another one of my favorite um, theoretical 
wonderful business as Lawrence Krauss, you know? I mean, I don't mean to offend your, your biblical point of view, but, you know, you said forget Jesus. The stars died so that we could live and, and come into being. And, you know, he's a really smart guy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right. And I'm, so far, and I'm listening very carefully, uh, and you're explaining, um, and you're giving me some detail as to what you think happened, but... Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking for some kind of proof that, that will con convince me. And so far, everything you're telling me uh, is, it sounds nothing more than, than theoretical. How, how, uh, you, you mentioned the scientific method uh, at the beginning, and I, from what I understand, that's uh, being able to perform an experiment and to prove your point, and it, and it has to be able to be repeated. Uh, and uh, it repeated, you get the result over and over again, so you're convinced it's true. But uh, you can't really do a scientific method or an experiment on the universe. You can't recreate the universe, can you? So how do we, how am I supposed to know that that's a fact rather than just a, some fantasy that someone dreamed up through through uh, you know their wishful thinking? Well, yeah, we just observe what we see today, and then we extrapolate that over billions of years that we know is true from looking at radiometric dating and looking at the cosmic evolution and, you know, that's my, not my expertise in astrophysicists, but, you know, some of these other guys, they put out incredible stuff about the expanding, ever expanding universe and how it all began. And, mm -hmm. you, know, I, you know, I can't prove it and, you know, if you ask them, maybe they say they can, maybe not, but I kind of just take it you know, by faith. Well, okay, that's 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 what I uh, was uh, some summing some uh, some surmise, surmising, I guess, is it sounds like uh, since you cannot go back in time and repeat this creation to to show me, then you're you're I, I have to just believe this based upon you know having my confidence in your your theory or your your viewpoint. Uh, so. Uh, I, I'd like to, as we go along, see if you can actually give me any kind of proof that is um, uh, rather than just a, 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 a series of theories. But we'll see how this, this goes. So you, you're, you're uh, saying, and I'm going to call it a theory. Uh, and you seem to be convinced that this, you can present these ideas as though they were proven facts. Uh, but so far, you haven't given me any reason to believe they're proven facts. It sounds like they're all sur surmising and uh, uh, deductions. Uh, uh, so uh, if, if you're believing that um, th there was a dot, now, is it, is it important, is it essential that there had to be a dot of, 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 that existed? Is that, is that essential to your belief? Okay. And everything just came into being at this time. All right. So, so you're uh, you're basing this uh, universe on uh, there was some kind of tiny piece of matter, and it exploded. And it was I guess it was densely packed, and uh, it exploded into the universe, which is so vast in size, and and uh, like it, it's mind boggling when we when we look at how big the universe is and how tiny even the Earth is in the universe. It's the uni the, I'd say that the Earth, uh, as far as the space the Earth occupies and the, the size of it, wouldn't be any more than one grain of sand on all the, the beaches in the, the world or even all of the grains of sand in the world. I mean, that's how vast the universe is. And you're saying that that all came from one tiny, maybe almost molecular sized piece of matter. Okay. Can we can prove that with the scientific method. 
Well, um, th this is where I'm uh, a little confused. So based on what you said the scientific method is, it's a, you have to be able to repeat it uh, to, to, as part of the scientific method. So I don't think you can prove that with a scientific method. Uh, it, it, don't you have to just conclude it based upon uh, the theories and, uh, you know, drawing conclusions, as you said? Well, no, personally, I mean, I, I think that there, there, there was a time um, in, in, in past where people would believe that a certain uh, certain scientific things were uh, were true, and then uh, as time passed, they said, well, we were wrong about that, and now this is, this is now we've learned more, and now we know it's, that this is what, the, this is the case, this is the real, true reality. So just because there's a majority or a, a large number of people who form a consensus, that doesn't convince me. Sometimes uh, the consensus can be wrong. But I'm, I'm going to get back to this piece of matter. First of all, it, 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 based on what you're telling me, there had to be something to explode. I would like to know where that something came from. It doesn't doesn't it have to have a beginning point to? I mean, uh, how did that come into existence? begs the question then it's just uh, we go we can regress back to the the next point is well where did that come from where did that come you're saying that there's another universes and there's uh, aliens that seeded the planet well where did they come from uh, and there had to be at some point where uh, there was nothing and then something came into existence uh, and now I'm not an expert on science like you are but uh, doesn't there have to come a point where there's uh, there's a, a, an uncaused cause? You know, the law, there, I, I don't know if this is really a law, but uh, I've heard it stated as the law of cause and effect. Um, if, if there is a law of cause and effect, then um, uh, if the universe came into existence, doesn't there have to be a cause for that? Well, okay, that's where I'm going to assert my skepticism again, uh, because you're asserting this, but you haven't given me any kind of proof. You're just saying you know it, and the and the scientists agree on it. And, but I, 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 so far, if if the goal here is to um, prove to me or persuade to, the, to me that these things are true, all I'm getting is speculation and theory upon theory. So, uh, my, but getting back to my question. Uh, I, from what I've heard, scientists do agree that the universe did have a beginning. I, I know that in the, the past, they, they thought that the universe was, was um, eternal, um, but now they, they all agree that no, it had a beginning. Well, the question then is, if it had a beginning, what caused it? There doesn't have to be a cause, and, you, and you, uh, you're not going to convince me by just saying, you know it couldn't be God. Uh, whatever, whatever you want to call it, Something or someone had to cause it, didn't it? It couldn't have it just come into existence without anything causing it. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying, but again, we see everything from an evolution. 
evolutionary standpoint, and we know evolution is true. I mean, we see species change all the time. And so if you just carry that logically backwards billions of years, then we can see kind of where this whole thing began, and it's through evolution. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, well, let me move on. I don't want to belabor the point, but so far I've asked you, uh, what's the cause? And you say, well, it could be anything but God. And that's not a very good uh, answer. So you're not, you're not persuading me so far, uh, Dr. Jack. Uh, uh, but now the next question is, now, again, I, I, I plead ignorance, and I'm not a scientist, but I know, I've heard of this law, law of thermodynamics, uh, uh, that, um, the first law, I believe, is that matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed, uh, it can, but it can change forms, but it cannot be created nor destroyed. Is, is that still considered to be a scientific uh, fact or, or a law today? Yeah, those are, those are scientific facts. The first and uh, second laws of thermodynamics, and, you know, the guys that in, invented these are really smart guys and they know what they're talking about. Well, if, if, then if we can agree that matter and energy cannot be created nor, or destroyed, it can only change forms, then uh, uh, it goes back to my other question is, if, if it can't be created, then where did the first matter come from if it can't be created, unless there's some supernatural creator that created it, uh, some uh, if everything, if there's a cause and effect to everything, well, the very first thing that, that came into existence, there had to be some uncaused cause that we traced it back to, and that's what we call God. We call God the uncaused cause, that he, he did not have a beginning. But the, we, we were all in agreement that the universe had a beginning, so it had to have a cause, and uh, we believe that the cause is God, and from what you're telling me, the cause... Uh, it could be anything. It could be aliens, or uh, uh, who knows what your various theories are. But, but but it couldn't possibly be God, and you're not giving me any reason why it could not possibly be God. Why why isn't that a viable possibility? Well, you know, I guess it could be if you know you didn't understand science and you were just putting your faith in, you know something that you've never seen before, but I've seen all these men in the lecture halls and I've seen all their books. And over time, all these smart guys have just been evolving this scientific method more and more to what we have today. And, you know, it, again, you know, I said, I admitted it. It comes down to faith ultimately. You know, it's just, I guess I just put my faith in men more than I do than in your God. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, I wonder, have you ever asked any of these scientists, experts, these authors, uh, any kinds of questions that I'm asking you now? Have you ever thought to maybe take a skeptical approach instead of just accepting what they say? Have you ever been skeptical and said, hey, well, I don't know about that. Why should I just accept that blindly? And have you ever asked the kind of questions I, I'm asking you now and challenged them, asked them to prove the point instead of just accepting it? Well, that's what the scientists say. Yeah, and, you know, again, I just, I just trust what they say, and, you know, I'm sure that they, they're, you know, I'm, I'm a really smart scientist, but they're a lot smarter than me, and I just trust what they say, you know. I'm sure that they've had other people challenge them with these questions, and they, I'm sure they have logical, scientific explanations for all of them. I'll have to, I'll have to, um, maybe give one of them a call and, you know, or at the, at the next scientific meeting, I'll, I'll ask them yeah. about that. Yeah, I, I hope in the future you do uh, adopt a, a skeptical attitude uh, towards uh, uh, all of these things, and you don't just blindly accept what these uh, experts tell you and uh, challenge them and ask them to uh, prove it. Uh, that's what I'm asking you to do now. Can you prove it, or should I just accept this based upon, you know, uh, various scientists and men's opinions? Okay, let's go forward now, because there's a lot of ground to cover. And uh, all we've gotten to so far... Oh, by the way, I, I want to ask you about the second law of thermodynamics. The, the first law, uh, matter can neither be created nor destroyed. 
uh, it can only change forms. The second law is that um, everything uh, moves from uh, order to disorder. Uh, in other words, everything is falling apart. Uh, you know, if uh, the example is the human body wears out, it falls apart. Uh, a door on its hinges, you know, if, if you uh, open and close the door at times, the, 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 potty, the parts wear out and it, uh, it falls apart. Um, it's not natural that, that things should just come from, move from a chaotic uh, state into an organized state. The natural thing, according to the second law of thermodynamics, is that it does the exact opposite. It goes from an organized state and gradually falls apart into disorder. Now, if that's the law, second law of thermodynamics, doesn't that argue against uh, the idea that things just kind of became organized, particularly organized by themselves without a, an organizer like God? Well, you know, if you, if you have a small subset, then that can happen. But if you have billions of years and enough time, then every once in a while, one of these random chance mutations or these freak events will all of a sudden create order. And so it's not that that law is true. It's just that if you have billions of years and all of these times that something could happen, eventually the unlikely becomes likely. Hmm. So, uh, again, um, you haven't given me any proof, uh, there, therefore you're, you're uh, asking me to believe that based on, on faith then, that, uh, uh, that uh, somehow, if uh, enough time passes, that uh, uh, rather than becoming disorganized and, and moving towards chaos and, and disorder, that the law of uh, entropy is what it's called, that things move into disorder, the law of entropy doesn't really always apply. That, and given enough time, it actually starts to organize itself. What 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 is behind this organization of uh, that is you said through chance, random chance and time, huh? Now let me ask you why why do you why do you convince that's true? Do you have any kind of proof to that, or am I supposed to also accept that on just faith? I don't have any just absolute proof on that, but again, if you look at just the, the time factor, that that is so see, I think you're missing the point on that. Because you know, I don't think you understand that how long almost twenty billion years ago is. And you know, twenty four hours a day for twenty billion years, eventually chaos will turn into organization if you give it enough time. Yeah, but okay, that's a that's a statement, uh, it's a premise. I call it a theory, but why is there anything that we know that can actually prove that to be true? Or again, am I how supposed to just, it sounds like you're, almost sounds like a fairy tale to me. It's like um, a long, long ago, long, long time ago in a far distant place, uh, this thing happened. That, that's how, isn't that how fairy tales started? I'm not a child, I, you know, I'm an adult, I think for myself, and I'm skeptical. So I'm not, I'm not going to accept this if you give enough time, somehow, it sounded like miraculously, that things go from chaos into order, uh, that uh, that seems to me like a fairy tale, and it's like, I'm not going to accept that on blind faith, you, you, unless you can prove it to me. That's, I think that you're just being, uh, it's no different than you believing a fairy tale, I think. Well, I've heard that uh, argument, and I, I know that uh, um, there's a thing, the, the laws of statistical probability, and uh, the chances of something uh, happening, if you apply uh, probability to it, and then multiply it out, the chances of something happening, like, like you said, even, even for them to write one complete line out of Shakespeare, much less than in all of his writings, just to write one line of Shakespeare to get 
uh, each letter formed and, and to have them in the right order, it's mind boggling the, um, the uh, uh, probability to make that happen. It's like one chance out of 10 to the 100th power. That's like the, and I'm just making up the number. I don't know what it actually is, but it's a huge number. It's, it's, it's like 100 zeros after, one chance after that. Uh, out of that, and, and you're expecting me to put me confident that that happened when that you have that kind of odds against it happening? Well, it seems like you, you should, logically, you, your, your, your conclusion should be, I doubt it. I don't think that happened because of the odds are so much against it, instead of thinking, oh, there is a slight chance, so it, it must be true. I, I, I don't understand that kind of thinking. Well, I am ignorant, all right. There's a lot I don't know, but that's why I'm asking you. And so far, I haven't gotten any kind of proof or anything that's uh, convincing at all. Uh, remember, I'm not going to accept anything just on, uh, you know, uh, the fact that you're a scientist and, uh, and scientists say this. Uh, unless I, you can give me more proof than that, I'm skeptical. I'm, it sounds like a, a, a ridiculous, far-fetched theories to me. But now let's move forward again to, okay, so now... Um, there is a uh, matter and energy exists. It's exploded into this vast universe, and but there's no life. So you agree that there was at some point there was no life, right? That's right. Okay. Yeah. So life so through like, the evolutionary process, well, like this universe. Well, let me let me ask you then. Uh, forget about the evolutionary process for a second. Let's just talk about the the moment. That life came into existence. Uh, there's a word for that. I forgot what it is, but the the event where life, for the very first time, came into existence. Well, how did that happen? Well, we're not exactly sure, but what we think happened was that in this hot, molten environment that we had at one time on this earth after billions of years of cosmic evolution, that at some point in time, there was some form of water, maybe from a asteroid or a comet or something that bombarded this Earth and cooled it down, and we had some liquid water, and then through all the storms and chaos that were obviously probably happening at that time, that energy was given to this what we call primordial soup and you know there was enough amino acids and sort of these base elements and when energy and water in the right environment at the right time the spark of life happened at that moment in time and then over time we have everything that we see living today from that single moment all right. Well, I don't want to move forward too fast here. I just want to talk about that moment when the first life came into, into existence. So you think there's some kind of spontaneous generation of life and, uh, it was, it was accidentally caused by explosions and chemicals. And, but let me ask you, you talked about the scientific method. Can, can you repeat that and, and cause that to happen so I can see it? Because you're presenting this like, well, this is what we uh, believe, or we actually, you and others uh, present more than just 
what you believe. It ha is, if you're stating it like this is science, this is a fact, and yet you can't repeat it, and it can't be proven with a scientific method. So it sounds like some really strange uh, theory to me uh, that, uh, as I said, it. It's it, it's laughable. I mean, as you're explaining that to me, I almost laughed out loud to, to think, well, why would someone dream up some kind of a, a weird uh, explanation for life coming into existence when, to me, the logical thing is that uh, uh, life doesn't come from non-life unless uh, unless it's caused to happen by um, a, a creator. Someone has to create life uh, and. and and even even when you said that the scientists are they're putting their minds together, uh, well, see, it still it doesn't just happen unless the scientists put their minds together. There has to be a mind behind it. So if you think that scientists will they can put their mind behind it and make it happen, then I say, well, God is the mind that was behind it originally and made it happen the first time. That's what I think. And, and I, I can't prove that any more than you can prove your theory. But I believe it, and I, I have a lot of reasons to believe it, but I can't prove it to you. I have, a, I, I, my opinion is based on faith. But you're, you're, what I want you to see is that you don't have any more proof than I do. You're, you're, you're just, uh, it's all faith, and it's really, it's, it's a weird kind of religion that you believe in, it looks like to me. continue on this this uh, uh, this first life was it would you are you uh, claiming or believing that this was like a single cell form of life something like that Dr. Jack, let's not jump ahead because I'm not that smart. Uh, I, I need to just go one step at a time here, okay? Let's stay focused on this idea that a single cell came into existence, even though, to me, the probabilities of something like that happening without some uh, mind behind it is just like mind-boggling the, uh, the odds of it against it. And yet, let's say that that happened and you have a one cell of life in the universe that first came into existence, okay? Now, uh, why didn't that life just die? Why, you say, uh, it, 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 for it to happen, do you think it happened one time, or somehow a whole bunch of these little um, single cells came into existence? Because it seems to me, for one of them to come into existence would be like one chance of 10 to the billionth power. It's just like ridiculous to even happen once. So um, if it did happen once, why didn't it just die? Uh, why, why are you thinking that somehow it's split in half? Uh, that's called asexual reproduction, right? When a cell divides into two cells. Why do you think it did that? Uh, it, how did it know how to do that? Well, I think it was just a matter of the right conditions and the right environment, given the right energy and the building blocks of life that were present at the time. And it might, may not have been just one single cell organism, you know, at the time of the lightning strikes or whatever time period over a vast amount of land, there could have been millions and millions of these single cell organisms created within a small amount of time. And yeah, a lot of them might have died, but you know, a few of them survive, you know, natural selection and the, the hardy ones, the, the ones that were that are adapted to their environment, they survive and they produce offspring through asexual reproduction. And eventually, you know, here we are. Okay, so you're you're asking me, first of all, 
to believe something that is, to me, uh, so improbable, I find it impossible, that all of a sudden a single cell just came to existence by itself, and then it had enough sense to divide itself in half and then continue dividing in half without anybody designing it that way or, uh, you know, uh, so that it would. It just it just happened. You're asking me to believe that, and, and I'm a skeptic, but you're not giving me any reason to believe it except it sounds like some really a desperate attempt to believe something, anything other than God being behind it. Well, that's, you know, that's just sort of the, the theory. And, you know, we know from cell biology how organisms split. And it's, um, you know, I guess you could say it's kind of a design, you know, based on the DNA there. But, you know, that's not to say that the DNA is a, a blueprint of a designer or anything like that or a creator. You know, I, I just think it might have happened by chance. Well, well that, that's a good point. That's a good point to go to next. The, the fact that uh, every living cell does have DNA. And, and DNA now, now I think that uh, we really understand what it is. Uh, it's, uh, it's instructions on uh, the cell building itself and reproducing. Uh, now, uh, it's, it's, it's like a blueprint or a design for the cell or for the, uh, the, the living, um, living thing. Uh, it, how could the cell just have that, these uh, in DNA instructions, uh, without someone writing the instructions and, and putting it in the DNA, in the, in the cell? I mean, there's a lot of electrobiologists that, that probably have a better answer than I do. Because um, I bet, you know, it is, a, it is a code, it's a language, it's a beautiful language and blueprint to, to show that there is design to life. But I'm just saying that based on all the science books that I've read, what I've been taught, that that design happened over billions of years by chance and not a designer. Well, from what I understand, again, I apologize that I, you know, I haven't studied science like you have, but the, from what I understand, um, the amount of information in one cell's DNA is so vast that the information is greater than like an entire set of the encyclopedia. Tani Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, there's that much information in a cell. So I'm wondering uh, why you would think that all that kind of information that is basically the more we study, we see that it's instructions to help it, to build the cell and reproduce the cell, uh, that that just happened, that it just came into existence without, um, if it's the way the cell is going to be designed, there has to be someone that does, uh, put the instructions there uh, and and that's the designer. That's what I call God. Um, so how could there be all that information? To me, this is this is what really convinces me more than anything else. If I had to single out one thing, is that the uh, amount of information in every cell. See, information cannot happen by just random chance. Uh, information has to be uh, come from a mind. So with that kind of information in the cell. Doesn't there have to be a mind behind it, and the the mind—that's uh, what I call God. So, uh, do you really do you really expect me to believe that all that kind of information just happened to show up in the cell without some mind behind it? Well, there's a chance it could have, but you know, maybe a better way to look at it is, is like you mentioned earlier. You know, aliens could have seeded this planet from another universe, something that had already evolved, that already had design in it, and then it was placed here and then evolved. Yeah. Well, I know you've mentioned that earlier, but doesn't that just delay the, the question? Uh, uh, the alien you're saying could be the mind that's behind it rather than God. Why couldn't it just be God that's the mind behind it? Why do you have to say, well, maybe it was aliens? And if it was aliens... Then we have to go back to the same question we've been asking it and apply that towards all these aliens. How did they come into existence? 
There has to be a point where there was a beginning uh, and, and uh, there was a, 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 some cause that, co that was behind uh, uh, the beginning of things. And that, that, that uncaused cause is God. Whether it's God created the aliens and then the aliens created us, it, it, there has to be, when you go continue back, it has to end up with, with God. Because God's the uncaused God. God is eternal. And I guess, you know, we could, we could go back and speculate, you know, that ad nauseum to see, you know, where a designer or a creator began. Um, you know, you choose to believe that there's this everlasting creator and, um, you know, and I, I think that just from what we see here and, and all our smart, you know, smart guys that, that know a lot of stuff about science, you know, I'm, I'm just going to blindly trust them, you know, through faith. Mm -hmm. What they're saying in their science books is correct. I mean, that's what my favorite science teachers in, in high school and college, you know, they know a lot. They're really good people. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just trust them. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for, I'm hoping at some point you're going to give me an answer that I can say, oh, you've actually got some proof rather than one theory upon another theory. And every theory seems to be like mind-boggling, uh, you know, odds against it. Uh, except it, it, the odds are so much against it, except that's what you're expecting me to believe instead of the, the, the fact that it's so improbable I should not believe it. Uh, but let's go, let's go further now. Uh, so now we've got this single cell, and it's reproducing through cell division. Uh, now, there's something else called sexual reproduction. So uh, at some point, this life form had to, as you say, evolve and get to the point where it, it could uh, uh, reproduce sexually, where you have a male and female part uh, coming together, conjugating and creating a new life. Uh, it, so, am I right in thinking that there, uh, after asexual reproduction, after that there came into existence sexual reproduction? That's right. Okay, so how did that happen? How did all of a sudden this cell that's dividing, how did it know how to become uh, sexual? Well, you know, it's just uh, it's just a matter of. Um, evolution just uh, through mutations you know a lot of these mutations were deleterious but there were some that that helped that organism to adapt better and at some point in time and we we really don't know um you know what point in time it was but at some point in time based on that organism's environment and what was going on, sexual reproduction was more advantageous than asexual reproduction into producing more offspring and continuing that progeny line. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go to the moment in time where you had the very first um, sexual uh, uh, organism. Uh, it, it wasn't going to reproduce through... Um, through um, uh, cell division, but it was going to reproduce sexually. Well, that first one, was it a male or a female? Well, we don't know. We, I mean, we weren't there. I mean, I can be honest about that. So I'm not sure. I'm sure that there was probably this going on spontaneously over, you know, over years with the right time, the right environment, and, you know, just... Uh, now, you're, you're the evolution of the organism created some male and some female. Okay, so you're, uh, you're asking me to believe that um, these cells were producing asexually by cell division, and then at some point there had to be a very first one that was sexual. I mean, obviously it has to be a first of everything. So there was one. Now, that first one, let's say... Since you don't know, let's just guess. Say it was a male. Uh, uh, wouldn't wouldn't there have to be 
a, a perfectly matching female that came into existence at the exact same moment in time, at the exact same location in the universe for them to reproduce? Yeah, and you know, it's just again, going back to a matter of chance, with billions of these organisms, there had to be some that began as a male and some as a female, and then they just hooked up in their primordial soup and, and that was when the sexual reproduction revolution began. That was the original sexual revolution. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, the, the chances of it happening one time are so remote, it's mind-boggling. And then you're asking me to believe that not only did it happen once, but it, but when it happened, by, oh, it was your, uh, awfully good luck that there happened to be a female uh, counterpart that came into existence at the exact same time. Otherwise, that first male would have died without reproducing, unless it had a matching female that evolved at the same moment in time and the same, exact same location. Exactly. Uh, that, it couldn't happen to anybody else, right? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I I didn't want to resort to laughing, but that's just it's so absurd uh, that you you actually think I would believe that. And I, I'm I'm surprised that you you can accept that kind of thing on blind faith without uh, having a healthy amount of skepticism. Okay, so now let's 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 go a little further here. Okay, so now we have an organism that's sexually reproducing, and it's still very simple. Um, let's say you you think that it evolved into a more complex form next, right? Is that correct? Correct. Um, I'm not sure if you can describe what the next form was after the single cell. Uh, do you have any idea what the very next one was after the single cell life form? Uh, I don't. You know, it was, it was some type of multi-celled organism that was, you know, most likely in an aquatic environment and, you know, Reproducing sexually, and um, you know, over over time, it just sort of evolved into you know maybe something that looked like a you know precursor to a fish or something. All right, but you can't repeat this as an experiment, and you can't really prove it with a scientific method. But it's again, you're asking me to believe it, and just based upon some theory someone imagined. Uh, you're not giving me any more proof than that, right? thing that I got for Christmas and if you see those you don't see anything at first then all of a sudden over a few weeks you see all these little things swimming around <laughs> okay yeah yeah okay well that's uh, that's because life exists today and life reproduces today but I'm, I'm we're going back to the beginning of, uh, of life uh, coming into being and moving from single cell uh, to a more complex life form and, okay, let's 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 say that uh, these uh, instead of single cell, it's got multiple cells, and it's beginning to look like something we'd recognize t today. Um, I wonder what kind of systems it had uh, in its uh, in its body. Uh, like, take for example, man. Right now, we know that we have uh, a respiratory system. And we have a circulatory system. Uh, we we have a skeletal system, a nervous system, a digestive system. And um, I'm wondering, uh, with this first complicated form of life, it, it it had to have some kind of a system. It, it had to be able to uh, have food, and it had to it had to excrete. It had to. Would you would you think that's the case? Okay, so the, 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 the system of doing that, how did that come into being? The, the something that's more complicated, that, that uh, it has a means of taking in food and, and then digesting it and excreting it. Yeah, the, you know, for, for evolution to, to be true, you have to have all these complex systems in a living organism to happen concurrently, you know, and a good circulatory system to deliver oxygen, you gotta have a good digestive system to get the nutrients for energy and an excretory system to get rid of all the, 
metabolites and waste and you know and and so obviously it just sort of evolved all together. Okay, so here I told you earlier that the the main uh, point for me that prevents me from accepting uh, your uh, your viewpoint uh, is the uh, the fact that. Uh, when, now that we know about DNA, and we can see its information and instructions, uh, there had to be some mind behind it. Information and instructions cannot come through randomness, random chance, uh, so there has to be a mind behind it. So that tells me that God exists. Now the next phase of this uh, is, is, okay, now we have life existing in a simple form. See, what I believe is, uh, I believe God was the mind behind creation, and he created this as a finished product. That you know, that Adam and Eve in the uh, biblical account of uh, they were created as a human being at one moment, and they didn't evolve gradually into a human being. That's what I believe. But and the reason I believe it had to happen that way is because of a concept called irreducible complexity. And, that, and now let me give an example, and let me ask you to explain. Uh, uh, if, if, if there's an answer for this, um, the we let's take uh, any system. Let's say uh, let's say your um, your circulatory system. Okay, the circulatory system it has blood, right? Correct. Okay, so the, and we know that the blood carries nutrients and it carries oxygen, and uh, so. How did the blood come into existence and, and know, uh, have the ability to carry nutrients and and oxygen to the body? Yeah, you know, the, the hemoglobin, the, the molecule, is one of the most complex molecules we see in science. And, you know, it's, it's very interesting, you know, that that's sort of a life source for living organism is, is in the blood. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we just don't have those answers on exactly how all that began. We just sort of see what we see now and extrapolate, you know, macro evolution from the small micro evolution or natural selection that we see now. Okay, I, I, I'm... I, I, there's a lot to this this problem here that I want to ask you about, but I'm just using blood as, as as my first example here. So, blood couldn't just be like water; it has to be made up of uh, something else somehow. And so, I'm wondering um, how if it had to be not only just a fluid, uh, but it also had the had the ability to to uh, take nutrients and oxygen. Uh, it, could the blood exist and do its job unless it also at the same time uh, had those abilities to, to take oxygen and, and nutrients? Didn't all that happen that has to happen at the same moment in time? In other words, you can have blood doing its job unless it also had the ability to carry nutrients and oxygen, right? It had to have all of those qualities from the very beginning, right? Right. Okay. Now, another point, okay, not only did the blood have to exist as, as that finished product, but didn't the blood have to have veins and arteries to, to, uh, for it to travel through? Correct, yeah. I mean, could, could, the, could the blood have existed without the veins and arteries? It wouldn't have anywhere to go. Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have done its function. And could the, what about the, if you had the veins and arteries, but there was no blood? You know, they had to work, exist at the same, from the beginning. Couldn't, they couldn't have involved piece by piece. That's, in other words, it's irreducibly complex. Uh, the whole thing had to exist. Uh, and you, not only that, you better have a heart. And the heart's pretty complex. So, uh, the heart had to exist, uh, as a pumping organ, uh, um, so that, uh, it could pump the blood. And the blood had to have the ability to carry oxygen and, uh, um, uh, nutrients, and it had to have a vascular system for it to transport it through. Didn't all that has to happen from the very beginning? It couldn't. Have, it couldn't evolve piece by piece, could have it? Didn't it have to be all uh, finished uh, system for it to work? Yeah, the, you know, the circulatory system had to had to happen at all at that same time, just like when the single cell organism, you know, came into existence. It had to have the cell membranes 
to work as that to make it a organism that can be contained and have living processes within it. It had to have the mitochondria for energy and the Golgi apparatus and all these complex cell systems within just a single cell. So obviously the same thing had to happen as we evolved and got, you know, more systems and, and, and bigger and uh, were able to, you know, develop a, uh, a brain to eventually, you know, observe our environment and react within it. Okay. Uh, all right. So you're agreeing that it had to all exist at, 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 as a complete circulatory system. The system couldn't evolve just a heart without a vasculatory system. The heart and vasculatory system had to exist as a finished product. But you're you're asking me to believe that that all came to existence in a, in a split second moment in time because because it, it it couldn't have evolved part by part, could it? So let's continue on with this. The, uh, uh, you're asking me to believe that the entire circulatory system of a, uh, in a person uh, came into existence as, as a complete system uh, instantly and uh, because it couldn't have evolved just the blood first and then just the, then the circulatory system and then later the heart. It had to be complete. And then that, that begs the question, well, how could the circulatory system exist without a respiratory system too? Doesn't the respiratory system have to exist at the same time in order to provide the oxygen to go into the blood? Exactly, yeah. So do you think then that the respiratory system and the circulatory system both came into existence, uh, the lungs and, and uh, the, uh, and I don't know how, how to describe the respiratory system that well, but all the aspects to a respiratory system came to existence and the circulatory system too. And now then, of course, it had to have a uh, 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 the skeletal system. I mean, uh, it, it had to have that as a, as a kind of a frame for the, the organ for the human organism. And didn't that, didn't it also have to have a, a muscular system? I mean, you couldn't very well have a muscular system uh, on a human unless the skeletal system existed at the same time, could you? I mean, the muscles have to have bones to attach to, 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 to cause uh, uh, locomotion. The, the body can't move in, uh, without muscles and bones. So you have to have skeletal system and muscular system at the same time. Correct. Okay, well, I don't want to, I don't want to go on and on, but we could point out every, every cell in the body. Uh, then you've got all the organs of the body, and then the, all the various systems of the body. All of this, this is why I believe God had to create man as an intact finished product from the beginning. It's impossible for us to, to be evolved piece by piece because of irreducible complexity. We can't reduce it and say, okay, you have a circular system, but, but you don't have a, uh, you know, a respiratory system. Okay. Correct. Um, all right, then. Um, well, let me ask you here. There's another question I have that uh, maybe you can help me with. Uh, I, I believe that Charles Darwin, said that for his theory to be uh, proven true, uh, he never felt it was really proven true in his lifetime to his satisfaction from what I understand. Later on, people uh, felt that they uh, had the proof that, the, that, that he didn't really have. But from, from what I read, he, he said uh, that these changes that you talk about there were random change, changes that happened to be beneficial. See, because most mutations are not beneficial, they're, they're uh, destructive. Uh, when there's a mutation, it's not a good thing, it's a bad thing, it's a, it's, it's a deformity. So, but you say that no, these mutations, some of them were actually good. But if we take that as a fact, then uh, Charles Darwin said, each one had to be a minute little change. It couldn't be a big change like we've been discussing, like all of a sudden you have a circulatory system. 
No, Darwin says, no, it didn't happen like that. It was very, very minute changes, one on top of another over a long period of time. And there would have had to have been uh, a, an archaeological or a, a fossil record to show uh, the changes. Uh, it, that's what Darwin said. There, better, there must be billions and billions of vast number of fossils showing that these minute little changes and there, there must be billions and billions of them. That's what he said. So my question is, where's the fossil record? You know, that, that saying, where's the missing link? Uh, where's all, where's all the fossils that show all these minute little changes? Uh, we haven't found them, have we? Well, that is one of the problems with evolution is the lack of transitional fossils. And, you know, even the, Smart guys like Stephen Cole and, and Stephen Stanley, they'll they'll talk about that, saying that the fossil record doesn't physically document a single transition from one species to another. But you know, the fossil record is is laid out nice and neat, and you know, it looks really pretty in the books, and and it teaches well. And so, even though we really haven't found those transitional fossils yet. You know, I think they're probably there, and we just haven't stumbled over them yet. Yeah. Okay. Well, it seems like, uh, according to Darwin, uh, there uh, there had to be uh, minute changes, and, and uh, the, the changes have to be so slight they're almost not noticeable. And then, uh, so to get from one organism to another organism, there must be millions of slight changes, and 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 that must have happened millions and billions of times. So if you if you consider that. Just from one slight organism change to the next, there should be an enormous, vast fossil record of all those intermediate uh, uh, changes. And yet, where are they? Uh, to me, they're, 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 they should be everywhere, uh, if, if what you're telling me is correct. And yet, we don't find them. Yeah, you know, this uh, gradualistic account of evolution, you know, that we should be able to see a lot of these transitional fossils, and I admit, you know, that's kind of a nagging problem for us. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me let me zero in then on just one uh, aspect of this problem. Um, now, um, how many uh, human remains uh, do you think exist around the world? Well, we know that some humans have been uh, uh, cremated, um, and some have disintegrated uh, over time. Uh, and, but let's just look at all the, the graveyards around the world, for example. Uh, just give me a just a guess. I don't expect it to be real accurate. How many intact human remains do you think exist on the Earth? Oh, I billions, maybe. How much? Maybe billions. Billions. So we've got, I think, about 7 billion people living today. And to reach that point, we must have had that much or more have, have lived throughout history uh, and died, and their skeletal remains are buried, and we can find them easily all over the world, right? And these are human being skeletal remains that are easy to find everywhere. Now, my question next is then, um, I've been told that um, we, we evolved from um, an ancestor, an ape-like ancestor, let's call them the the gorilla or the chimpanzee, that, that type of anim, animal. And now, uh, to take Darwin's viewpoint, the, dis, the difference between a chimpanzee or a gorilla and a man today is quite enormous. And Darwin said the changes had to be very minute and one on top of another. And so, the, uh, where are all the remains of all the intermediate between the, the ape and the man there must, there should be millions and billions of them. Uh, how many intact gorilla remains do you think we could find in the world? If we were to search the whole world to find all the dead gorillas and, and find their skeletons intact, how, and how many would you guess? Perhaps 200,000 maybe. Okay, so there's maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe some millions of gorilla intact remains. So if we have all the gorilla remains, they're intact, and we can prove that, that uh, okay, for a long time these gorillas have been uh, living and dying, and the remains are there to prove it, and we have man, billions of those remains, 
And yet, we should have much more of all the intermediate changes of between gorilla and man. There should be zillions of them. Because each, each little change is so minute. There must be, from one slight change to the next, there must have been a whole bunch of those, and they all died off. And yet, we don't see anything. Where's, where's the zillions of skeletal remains between ape and man? We got apes, we got mans, but I don't see any of them except for some that I think are fraudulent and, uh, and um, uh, that people have tried to fabricate. There's a couple of those, but they're not convincing at all. But there should be, uh, if there's a billion, billions of mankind, there must be zillions of those between ape and man, if you understand my point. Where, where are they? I do, and, you know, the tilt-down man, you know, being passed as a host, the job that's given us evolutionary biologists, guys, you know, kind of a bad name, and those, those transitional fossils, you know, they're probably just, just haven't been found for some reason. Uh, you know, the, the, Biologists and everybody. I mean, we're looking. Yeah. Uh, the geologists and you know, they, I guess they may just be deeper down in the in the dirt. We just haven't got to them yet. Okay. Well, oh, we know they're there. I mean, we know from the from the fossil record that that we see from man and and ape and a progenitor of man and ape. You know, I mean, there, there's got to be that they got to be there, right? Well, they got to be there if they existed. If they're if we if they're not everywhere, then it tells me they don't exist. There is no uh, transition from ape to man. It's it's totally fabricated, or else we'd have the skeletal remains everywhere. You don't think they'd be in every museum, don't you? Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, so um, there's a lot more questions that I, I could ask you, uh, Doctor Jack, but I, I know you're. You're a very busy doctor, and I really appreciate the time you've spent trying to answer these questions of mine. And, and as I said, I, I really want to know. If I'm, if I'm wrong, I don't want to remain wrong. And, um, and, but, but I approach everything. I've even approached my, my faith in, in, in Christianity and the Bible as a skeptic. And I, I, I believe that I've asked a lot of questions, and the questions have been answered to my satisfaction, so I'm convinced it's true. But as I ask you all these questions, and as I've asked others who are atheists and Darwinists, uh, they, uh, the questions I ask them, they're not satisfactory answers. Uh, I remain very skeptical. and In fact, I think that it's, it's uh, so far-fetched what you're asking me to believe that it's, uh, it's really beyond a fairy tale. It's, it's, it's basically almost delusional. And, and I, I would say, I don't want to offend you, but I, I would say that I, I theory, I, here's a theory for you. I think that you and others like you are basically uh, desperate to uh, find anything to believe in apart from there being a God. Now, I, why? I have some theories on that. I don't, I don't want to say for sure, but some people are so desperate that their God cannot exist, that they're willing to believe aliens seeded the planet, or life came from nothing, and then it gradually transformed, even though all the questions I've asked you, you haven't given me, I cannot recall where you give me one answer that I thought had any kind of proof or science behind it. So um, you haven't succeeded at all in, in persuading me. I, I'm very skeptical. Well, yeah, and, and you probably, you probably just got the wrong scientist. You know, I, I finished at the bottom of my PhD class and, you know, I failed a few classes. So I'll probably just have to call some of the experts. They'll have better answers for you. But you, you asked a lot of good questions and I'll give you credit for that. All right. Well, thank you. And okay, let's, let's end this conversation and, uh, um, if you think it's okay, I'll, I'll upload this on, on YouTube so others can, can uh, watch and listen. But before we do, I, I think we better introduce you. Uh, and tell, let's tell us who you actually are, and I appreciate you playing the part of a, a science. You are a scientist. You are a, a medical doctor. You certainly have all the credentials, uh, but you certainly are not an atheist and a Darwinist, are you? So why don't you just introduce yourself so everybody knows who I've really been talking to. Yeah, this is Jason Jack. I have um, a YouTube channel, Jason Jack, that I started at the beginning of the year, uh, dedicated to Jesus 
Christ, our Creator and Savior, and uh, just trying to put um, as many videos as I can to get the message out of the gospel. All right. Well, then, um, I, I hope if you're not familiar with uh, Brother Jason Jack and his YouTube channel, I hope you will go to it and subscribe. He, he, if you go to my homepage, Since City Preacher, on the right-hand side, there's a column of channels that I'm recommending, and he's right there. So I hope you'll subscribe to his channel, and uh, I know you'll be blessed by it. Uh, and I hope uh, that uh, the next uh, conversation we can have t together, brother, I don't know if we'll do it tonight or some other time, but uh, I want to really delve into who you are and... Uh, kind of interview you so everybody could learn more about you. But for now, uh, thank you. And I'll give you a, like, a chance to say any final thoughts you have, and then we'll, cl we'll finish this. Yeah, I thought this was fun. I was trying to keep a straight face <laughs> most of the time. Um, I, was, I gave a clue out here and there to make sure that, you know, people were, were um, getting that this was a little bit farcical. But, um, but again, you know, evolution, uh, whether it's cosmic, whether it is biologic, uh, takes more faith, I think, um, and atheism takes more faith than believing that there is a God and there is a creator. Um, and, you know, I was confused a long time about this uh, coming up through my science classes. And again, as you said, you know, I'm a medical doctor. I went to... I live in Birmingham here in Alabama and went to UAB for med school and then up for six years doing a surgery residency in Kentucky. And, um, you know, I, I was always searching and seeking for answers. And, you know, there was one day I finally, you know, several years ago, said, God, I've been trying to figure all this out on my own. You know, I've been trying to do it my way, reading science books to figure out the meaning of life, the what the universe is all about, what my purpose is, you know, what this life is all about. And I thought I could figure it out my way. And finally I said, God, I'm going to quit doing it my way and I'm just going to give it up to you. I'm just going to trust you. I don't care what you say. I, I'm going to believe it. And then I picked up the Bible and started reading it and then read it again and read it again. And, um, you know, the truth, the truth in the Bible, um, are absolutely mind-blowing and uh you know i think that coming from my background and having all these questions for so long and listening to all these things and i tried to you know halfway express and you know obviously i had thought about this for a long time on evolution and stuff so i was trying to you know give as good an answer as i could remember um but you know finally these things look foolish, and, you know, it just goes back to, um, you know, in the Bible, and I'll just read a quick verse in, in uh, 1 Corinthians um, that I think kind of sums it up, um, and you go to 1 Corinthians, um, you know, 125, for instance, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, and if you continue that, um, you know, in, in um, 1 Corinthians 2, 5, it says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so that's what I was trying to do throughout is showing that I was putting my faith in men and not God. And that was the reason that I was believing in all this evolution there in our hypothetical talk. And then finally, in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, it says in verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own practice. Um, and before that, in verse 18, it says, If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. And so I think it all comes down, like you said, to, you know, the Romans 1 comes to mind where the, the creature has rejected the creator and worships creation. And that's what we see, you know, that's what we see in, in all these evolutionary biologists and theoretical physicists and astrophysicists, they rejected the creator. So they start to worship the creation. Um, and, you know, that that's happened since the beginning. And we continue to see it happen today. Um, but for me, I was in, I was in that camp almost, you know, I was, I was, um, 
proud and prideful, thinking I knew a lot of science, to the point of almost becoming foolish. You know, but God's saving grace helped me out of that. And it got me where finally I humbled myself and, you know, became a fool in this world so that I could be wise. And that's where the wisdom is. You know, the wisdom is in the Bible. Uh, that's your foundation. And that's what everything else is based on in my life now. If, if I see something that is in the science textbooks, if it's not if it's not matching what is in the Bible, then you know I reject it. And and so hopefully this exercise will you know will bring to light some of that. Just to you know trust God, not men, not fallible light again. Trust the infallible, everlasting God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, I do find it very uh, noteworthy that there are so many verses in the Bible that talk about uh, this very thing, that uh, men are so foolish, they're desperate to not believe in God, and they'll, they'll believe anything. And that's, that's, it says it in the Bible, and, it, and we see it very prevalent today, that uh, they're desperate to not believe in God, and yet the proof of God is all around us. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, whoever watches this video, I hope that you will um, begin to ask all the questions that that I've been asking in this video here. And see, the mistake that I think that we make as Christians is that we we always let them put us on the defensive. And they all want to challenge us and and try to make us prove our our, our beliefs. And they want to poke fun at us. Um, And yet, even though I believe there's a lot of evidence to support the historicity and the, the, the reliability of the Bible and the, the reality that Jesus is God and Savior. I, I believe there's a lot of compelling evidence. So, uh, but uh, they, they, uh, they put the onus on us all the time. We need to flip this around and start asking them questions and make them defend their beliefs. And you'll find out that if you ask these follow-up questions, well, why do you believe that? Do you have any proof of that? That sounds absurd to me. It sounds no more different than, than believing the, the, well, you'd rather believe something absolutely unlikely instead of, instead of something that, hey, that, why do you, why do you want to believe that that happened when the odds are so remote and yet you embrace that? It's just, um, so, so I, I hope we'll all start, um, asking these questions to, the other side and put them on the defensive and make them defend their beliefs. Um, all right, brother. Uh, I look forward to uh, next time. And uh, one last word, uh, go to my channel and uh, brother uh, Jason Jack's channel. Watch all of our videos about salvation, but I'll sum it up right now that um, if you want to go to heaven after you die, uh, it's a simple matter of just putting your faith in Jesus Christ completely. Uh, and instead of thinking that you can get to heaven as a reward for living a good life, uh, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the only way we get to heaven is by relying completely on Jesus to be our Savior. We, we believe that uh, our sins are paid for because he died for them on the cross. We believe that he does have the power over life and death because he proved it by raising himself to life and the resurrection. We believe that we get salvation. Our place in heaven is assured to us. It's guaranteed because Jesus promised it to everyone who will put their faith completely in him. And it's as simple as that. Put your faith in Jesus right now completely and you're going to go to heaven. But if you try to get there some other way through your own efforts or through religion, um, it's, you're going to fail. It's impossible. All right, brother. Thank you for... Uh, the, the conversation, I'm going to close the broadcast, but uh, I'll talk to you on the phone here uh, afterwards. So bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.